Fifth area, health care costs. Now, uh, this is something that struck like a bomb earlier this week. It's a study that was done by uh, two professors, Paul Grutenhorst from the Faculty of Pharmacy at the U University of Toronto, and Aidan Hollis, who's with the Department of Economics from the University of Calgary. Came out just a few days ago. And this is the impact assessment of proposed pharmaceutical intellectual property provisions. When we talk about healthcare costs, this is fundamentally important. This study is making waves in the provinces across the country because what this study says is that CEDA will be adding nearly $3 billion annually mm -hmm. to our health care costs. Mm -hmm. How does it do this? Well, it extends the intellectual property protections to big pharmaceutical companies. So it takes longer to get the cheaper generic drugs on the market. Now, of the $3 billion, it's a quarter of a billion dollars that would be the impact to British Columbia's health care system. How could the BC government say yes to provisions that are going to cost us as taxpayers a quarter of a billion dollars more. And where is that money going to be found when you're throwing away a quarter of a billion dollars? So the provinces, just over the last few days, have started to wake up to the realization the Harper government has not come clean with them and has not given them the impact analysis that's necessary to evaluate this agreement. Now, about 50% of that $3 billion will go on provincial health care plans. That's about $1.5 uh, billion. The rest goes to either private health care plans, which means your premiums go up, and to individuals themselves. Now, we have hundreds of thousands of poor seniors in this country who depend on their medicines for their quality of life, and we know already that their dollars are stretched. We're now putting our own Canadian seniors in a situation where they're going to have to choose between the medicine that keeps them in good health or eating or heating. Despicable. Inappropriate. And that is where the Harper government is going with provisions that will severely damage our health care system. Six. Sixth provision of CEDA is the environment. Now, we all know that as inhabitants of this planet, one of the biggest challenges we face is the, the climate change uh, that is caused by greenhouse gas emissions. Now, our oil sands in northern Alberta cause three to five times the amount of conventional, uh, conventional oil production. The greenhouse gas emissions are three to five times greater. According to a study that was commissioned by the Indigenous Environmental Network and Friends of the Earth Europe, the government would be able to use the provisions of CETA that I mentioned earlier, particularly the investor state provisions, to stop the European Union from bringing in regulations against high greenhouse gas emission products, such as the products coming from the oil sands. The fear is also in the environmental movement that multinational corporations can use these so-called kangaroo courts, these special courts that are set up where they get to help name the judges to challenge existing environmental regulations and oppose new ones. Seventh area, arts and culture and communications. In NAFTA, there was a arts exemption that has been thrown away on CETA. In other words, our arts and cultural industries could be subject to the same challenges by the big transnational corporations, backed by those investor state provisions that I mentioned to you earlier, that we see in all other sectors. Our culture is our ability to communicate with each other and communicate with Canadians right across this great land. If we now have a situation where a European corporation or an American corporation masquerading as a European corporation can use investor state to undercut the cultural subsidies and the supports that we provide to our arts and culture sector, what could possibly be left? This is why the Canadian Council of the Arts has expressed profound concern about the direction that this government is going in. And the arts sector is starting to wake up to the realization that there is a very real danger and threat posed by CETA. In telecommunications, Canada controls its telecommunications sector, as you know. Uh, we have uh, foreign control uh, limits so that uh, our telecommunications sector has to be under Canadian control. We're not the only country that does this. The United States does it. Australia, Japan, and China, just to give other examples. 
Well, telecommunications and Canadian ownership of our telecommunications sector thrown on the table like everything else, irresponsibly, by the Harper government. So in arts and culture and communications, we're seeing the same threat that we're seeing in other areas. And the final area that I'll touch on, at least at this part, but believe me, there are other parts of CETA that uh, also have negative impacts, is intellectual property. Now, I mentioned earlier what the impacts would be on our health care costs, and they are considerable. <coughs> but listen to this. Uh, there is a seed directive called UPOV91. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of it. I hadn't heard about it until a few weeks ago. UPOV91. Had anyone heard about this before? Okay, well, good. Then I don't feel as stupid for not knowing about it myself. Now, this was a directive that uh, was tried, attempted to be brought into Canada and it was brought in in the United States. What it simply does is allow uh, exclusive private ownership of seed, seed watching, washing and seed storage. What it means is that farmers can no longer clean and store their own seed. It means that every year they have to go to the big multinationals in order to obtain the seed that they want in order to produce the food that feeds us. Now in the United States they succeeded in bringing this in. UPOV 91. As a result of that, they've been able to attack farmers who haven't followed to the letter the very careful corporate directives on Monsanto, for example, holding on to their seed. The average lawsuit brought against small American farmers under this directive is $385,000. That's the average. It has crippled the agricultural industry and the freedom of, speed, uh, freedom of seeds in the United States, and now it's being brought into CETA. Now, just to show you what this means for Canadian farmers, we've managed to maintain public access to some of our seeds. For example, in wheat, because of the research in the past, the background of Agriculture Canada, our wheat sector is largely a public seed sector. Canola uh, is rather a private sector. And over the past 20 years, even though canola and wheat have both risen the same amount, about 80% price increase over 20 years, which is, which is normal over that period, it's the difference in the seed cost that is so significant. The seed costs for canola, private seed, have been gone up 600% over that same period, whereas wheat seed, public seed, has gone up about the same amount as the crop seed itself. So to bring this intellectual property perfection, this UPOV91, into CETA means that our farmers will be crippled and under the direction of Monsanto and other related companies forevermore. And that's why the National Farmers Union has said so very clearly that they are fundamentally opposed to CETA and will do everything to stop it. Now the European Commission is negotiating this on behalf of Europe. And the European Commission, which is uh, elite bureaucrats, is, uh, to say the least, uh, beholden to very powerful industry lobbyists from the corporate sector in Europe. But what is interesting about this whole discussion around CETA is that for the first time, this agreement will actually be subject to the approval of the European Parliament. Now that makes this issue and this fight around CETA uh, a much more different one than it might have been if the European Commission, as it could before, could just sign on behalf of all Europeans. I traveled to the European Parliament just a few weeks ago, at the end of November, and I met with uh, a number of the parliamentarians along with, uh, with our trade committee, which is composed of uh, 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 mostly conservatives and some liberals. In fact, one of the members of the trade committee is your uh, current local oh, conservative member, oh, Ron no. Cannon. Mm -hmm. Tisha will be replacing in a very short period of time. Oh, wow. yeah. I, I, I like Ron, uh, but he's very much a conservative. And it was, for me, a particularly personal pleasure to walk into the European Parliament and meet with their trade committee. You see, in Canada, we've got one new Democrat and a couple of bloc members, and then liberals and conservatives. So it's an incredibly right-wing group of people. But in Europe, fortunately, there's a different electorate. And they walked in to a meeting with their trade committee 
composed of environmentalist members of the European Parliament, social democratic members of the European Parliament, leftist members of the European Parliament, progressive members of the European Parliament. And they came in and the European parliamentarians started going after them on environmental issues, on CETA, and why, why this would possibly help to stimulate oil sands production. <laughs> they talked about investor state and their concerns about this investor state provision coming to Europe, this cancer in our trade agreements in North America coming to Europe. And as these progressive members of the European Parliament spoke, there was massive culture shock on the conservative side. Their <laughs> mouths hung open because they literally couldn't believe that there were so many progressive people on the planet and that they were attacking some of these fundamental issues that we we're talking about tonight. The point I'm making is this. The European parliamentarians are not stupid. They're very bright, very progressive people. And so this agreement, with all of the egregious elements that we've been talking about, is no, by no means a done deal. No means at all. Because the resistance that is starting to come in Canada and the resistance that is starting to come in Europe is a fundamental reaction to the bad policy that we see here. I mentioned earlier, there's not a single bit of progressive policy in the CETA. No reflection of the progressive traditions in Europe on social uh, programs and environmental and, and labor standards or human rights standards. None of that at all. And in Canada, we should be seeking our inspiration from these types of, of fair trade components that are in many of the agreements that Europe signs. Because that's fundamentally what the issue is. This issue isn't about CETA so much as it is about the kind of country we want to see. You know, as Canadians, we've built an enviable place on this planet because we've built it collectively. We've built together the kind of social programs and social safety net that uh, certainly in past decades helped to support all Canadians. We built a, a universal public health care system that is the envy of other countries in North America. And we built that together. And it's fascinating to know that when Canadians were asked just a few years ago, who was the greatest Canadian in our history? Yeah. They chose overwhelmingly Tommy Douglas, the father yeah. of Canadian <laughs> medicine, because they believed in our health care system. We built a diversified economy that's based on creating family, family sustaining jobs, and middle class jobs that helped to build a community. And we did all of that together. The issue, really, when we talk about CETA, is what kind of country we want to see. And now in the coming months, as the debate increases on this issue, we'll need to stand together. <coughs> in this community, you need to be talking to your friends and family and neighbors. You're going to be needing to, to write to the local newspapers, phone into the, the open line shows, let your member of parliament, the current one, uh, not the new one, I think she already knows that, but the current one, let him know how you feel about CETA and how you think that the government is being irresponsible when we look at all of the provisions of the agreement. To talk about it, to fight it, to talk about it to municipal councillors and school board trustees, to get it out in the community so that more and more Canadians can become aware of the repercussions. We've built a phenomenal country together. We've seen over the last few years how that is starting to be free. And what NAFTA damaged, CETA will ruin. So I ask you tonight, if you're concerned as I am about the future of the country and the implications and the danger that is posed by CETA, let's fight together so we can stop this bad agreement and build the kind of Canada we all want to see, which is a Canada where everyone counts and where no one's left behind. And thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. And